Welcome to the Outer Realm with Michelle DeRoche and Amelia Pisano. Airing live on the United Public Radio Network, 105.3 FM in New Orleans. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Thursday night segment of The Outer Realm. We are broadcasting live on the United Public Radio Network, UFO Paranormal Radio Network, and 105.3 FM from the beautiful city of New Orleans. We are fully sponsored by the amazing people over at Folgers Coffee, who have been a part of our journey since the very beginning. And it's been a while. So thank you, Folgers. Also, big thank you to our other sponsor, uh, Justin Snicker, Dr. Snick, the sonic surgeon, uh, who is an award-winning composer of Halloween horror, sci-fi, and dark wave electronic music that can be found anywhere that good music can be found. Also, big thank you to artist Steve McGinnis for... The artwork you see here on the show. Um, tonight, we welcome for the very first time Kyle McDowell from the hit TV show Alaskan Killer Bigfoot. Uh, honestly, we're so pleased to have him. I am a fan of the show and um, I, I just I just couldn't stay out of it. It's hard to wait, you know, like a week. <laughs> Every episode that comes out, like, oh, waiting another week. It, it, it ends and you're like, oh. Out of the week. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's good to binge. <laughs> I know. I'd rather sit, binge watch it. It was really, yeah. really interesting. And I mean, like many other people, I'm really hoping that they come out with a season two, of course. Uh, but in order to participate in the show tonight, guys, if you want to get into the chat room to interact with us and with Kyle, uh, find us on, let's go through them all because they do tend to change at times. So YouTube, we have the Outer Realm. We have UFO Paranormal Radio. We have UFO Gods and Extraterrestrials. And then we've got, let's see, we're into, I don't know why <laughs> things are split. I'm looking at these messages are all split up on this. Crazy. Anyway, Facebook, uh, UFO Paranormal you. Radio, United Public Radio, The Outer Realm Radio, being us, yeah. Joe Montaldo, UFO <laughs> Undercover, News on the Flip Side, and Canada's Most Haunted and that is exactly the only places you can get to. So it's eight spots. That's a lot. Um, please, wherever you're watching, like it up, join, subscribe. It's really important, and we really appreciate um, the support. Um, so that, I think I've got it all. If I'm missing anything, I'm sorry. We have people chiming in. We've, I'm seeing Wayne, Melissa, Tyler. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> oh, Around my room. <laughs> I know. <it's> <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i know no it threw me off because i'm I'm looking and i'm going why is that message completely sped up or you don't have up? to explain yourself did you hear me last night i couldn't even i lost track train of thought in the middle of the intro just nice. completely like really are you serious like nice oh yes. <laughs> yeah it okay. happens. It's just been it's just been crazy and it's crazy time of year. So oh my gosh. I am just going to send Kyle uh, a link for the show. I'll go do that in a couple of minutes. Okay, so it's ready to go. <laughs> Looking ready. forward to it. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting. Um Portlock is you know, it's already known to have mysteries, like the mystery of the town that disappeared, and that was long before the show. You know, so I think now it's just going to be like it was. I found it fascinating just to listen to the history of everything as to why they were brought in for 40 days to yeah. investigate to see if it would be safe to go back. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, interesting 40 days like the Bible. Uh -huh. mm, maybe it's <laughs> interesting, but yeah, it is. It is it's not just, just like a month, you know, it's just yeah, it was that. So, so yeah. it, it's definitely interesting. Um, if you want to start with his bio, I will oh gosh, yes. send Kyle a message with the link right now. 
Definitely. Kyle McDowell was born in Michigan where he became an avid outdoorsman. And with this, he found his way to Alaska by way of Arizona, where he works as a mountain guide. In addition to guiding parties, Kyle often serves as a guard against rogue bears. Jeez. Crazy bears are big in Alaska. (laughs) They're huge. Yes, yes. That is how he came to Portlock, Alaska, helping protect the Alaskan killer Bigfoot team against earthly threats, at least. And if you watch the show, you'll understand that. Kyle owns his own company, Kenai Backcountry Adventures. Bam, here we go. And there's a website for you all who want to reach out to Kyle. You want to, you know, Bigfoot protection. It's like... So He's in Alaska right now. What time is it there? It's it's uh, he's actually four hours behind. Wow. Yeah, he could, big in BC. Tyler says, yeah, exactly. They're big in BC. Yeah, they're big uh, um, in the territories as well. I grew like, up up it, north, man, and I'm 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 okay with bears, but I think you know the Alaskan bears. Should be a bit uh, I'd rather not. Ooh, hello. hello. Hi, Kyle. This oh, is so hey strange. There. I watched you today. How are you? I, I'm good. Hey, Amelia. <laughs> hey, Michelle. How are you, too? We're good, good. good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank That's you. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, we book months in advance, and I had somebody that sort of needed to be moved. I was like, oh, I know exactly what I want to do. Nice. This. So really pleased that you're you're joining us. And um Really looking forward to hearing everything that you have to say. Um, Why don't we start? I mean, just tell us about yourself because anybody, you know, who sees you on TV or may have been on some of your adventures, we have your website up for everyone to see here. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, Yeah, well, I mean, thanks. uh, Thanks so much for having me on. It's, uh, It's cool to keep you know, talking about the, uh, the show and the project and, and ultimately it's like a project that, that really just worked itself into a show. Um, and hmm. it's, it's cool to still, you know, see the, uh, the response we're getting and the interest and everything and a lot of support for a season two, which we're all hopeful for. Um, but anyways, yeah. So about myself, um, so I live in Alaska full time, um, I own a company called Kenai Backcountry Adventures. We specialize in outdoor mountaineering style adventure trips um, throughout the state of Alaska. I also have a bear guard service um, that we operate, which is essentially, you know, doing things like what I was doing in Portlock, which is going out with different crews or people or individuals or whatever it might be to help them uh, stay safe in the field. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of where I'm at currently. Um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of, uh, I've done a lot of fun things on my journey um, so far. You know, I, I grew up in Michigan. I lived in Arizona for a while, and that's how I came to, uh, um, from Arizona to Alaska. But I've done a little bit of everything, but I've always focused and hovered in the outdoor space or the outdoor realm, if you will, mm-hmm. um, and just just naturally gravitate towards that. It's like, I, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I just always want to be outside. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really don't even care what the weather's like. I have this, <laughs> I'm weird, just there. Yeah. Yeah. I have this weird thing where like, I, <clears throat> I really like bad weather and I like to go out in bad Me too, weather. but not be in it. <laughs> well, so, yeah, if there's a blizzard. Yeah. Right. So if there's like some crazy blizzard, like I'm out there, I, I just love that kind of stuff. So, um, um well, you you're right you environment. do what you do though. Right. Like you wouldn't, <laughs> you couldn't be someone who doesn't enjoy all the elements and that and do what you're doing because you're, mm-hmm. you're facing them no matter what, when you take on a client, right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So it doesn't matter if it's, um, you know, one of our adventure expeditions or mountaineering expeditions, or if it's a bear guard project or something to that effect, you know, we're, we're outside in the elements and you have to be, you have to be ready, willing, and able to take anything that mother nature throws at you. Mm. Um, and so you, it's a lot of preparation. It's a lot of experience on how to just, you know, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and you just, the more you do it, you, you sort of change that, that needle, if you will, to being more comfortable with being uncomfortable. Right. But yeah, it's like, you, you can't, 
you can't just not go do something because it's raining or you just, you know, if it's a little cold or if it's a little, you know, snowy or something like that. You just you have to suck it up and do it pretty much. Yeah, you just, you just yeah. do it, especially when it's, when it's work. Um, you know, especially like with the bear guard stuff, um, you know, those are, those are companies, mostly companies or, or government entities that will hire me to go do that stuff. And, and they have, they have a project to be done. They have a, they have work that needs to be done. So it's like, there, it doesn't matter what the weather is. You just got to get it mm -hmm. done. But the, mm -hmm. the crews are going out and if the crews are going out, I'm going out with them. Right. Uh, and then like our adventure, our expeditions, you know, we, um, we fly out into the mountains in the middle of nowhere in Alaska and we get, we just get dropped off. And so it's like, <laughs> Alaska is such a wild place, though. It's yeah. like not not it's just so nature wise, as you know, yeah. but I mean, it's just got some stuff. <laughs> Your senses must be heightened when you're yeah. out there in that kind of weather as well, because are, mm -hmm. are these bears taking shelter? Are these entities that you're guarding from taking shelter? Um, yeah. So, I mean, the animals don't take shelter, um, mm. especially the predators, you know, so. Mm bears and, and wolves and things like that that are apex predators right. will actually use that weather to their advantage because mm -hmm. they're the prey type animals they're looking for are the ones that are hunkering down and bedded down so they're like okay this is prime opportunity to walk around and find something so what are you doing when you're, you're dropped off in the mountains what kind of an expedition is that um you know a lot of those are um they could it, well it kind of varies it's you know it's mountaineering so we're climbing mountains mm -hmm. or we're we're hiking up glaciers and Mm -hmm. you know, just sort of that, that environment. So like mountains and glaciers. Um, and then we do a lot of rafting expeditions or pack rafting expeditions, backpacking, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So we're basically, we're dropped off in these environments and we're traveling in and around or through them to either go somewhere or just adventure and sort of roam around and explore the area. And then we come back or we get to a point and then we get picked up. Right. Have you ever been stuck? Yes. With weather. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. What's yeah, the I, worst thing ever? Was it snow or rain? Because I would imagine mud can be just as treacherous, if not more. As far as like what caused us to get stuck or, yeah. um, well, I mean, there was one time we got stuck due to uh, smoke from a wildfire. Um, mm. the, oh uh, my <laughs> God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're going in by, by bush plane and these bush planes, they all fly, the pilots all fly them by visual flight reference or flight rules. So they got to be able to see where they're going. So if there's smoke or really dense fog and things like that, they just can't fly. So smoke was one. Another one was, was very, very hard rain, which created a, um, a lot of moisture in the air, which created like a fog and low clouds and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Just, it's what we call being inside of a ping pong ball. You look around and everything's white. You just you can't oh see my anything. God. You're basically in a cloud. Um, I'd so be that, crying. That's another one. And then mm -hmm. high wind is another um, element that'll typically do it as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'd be crying. Seriously. Yeah. It's... I'd be so stressed if it was like that because you can't see what's coming at you. So you would need that kind of training and that natural ability that you have to sense everything around you. Yeah. And it, 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 that's absolutely right. And it really keys into the, one of the comments you made. I mean, you're, when you're, when you're doing this stuff and you're in these environments, and especially if you're in these, these weather conditions, your, your senses are elevated to a level that most people really, I don't think ever experience. Um, <laughs> and I, I think, I think subconsciously that's one reason I really like to go out in bad weather because like when I'm in a blizzard and I'm walking around, my senses are just, whoosh, I mean, they're, wide oh, yeah. open and I'm living in the moment and I'm taking everything in and it's, 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 you're just alive, right? You're mm -hmm. just totally alive at that point. It's fascinating because people actually pay for this experience. Yeah. I would. Get lost in Alaska. Oh boy. <laughs> I'd, I'd do it if I had someone like you who was yeah. there and knew their way. I wouldn't, I would never adventure it on but my own. For but those, you know, in, in, in our line of work, Alaska is known as you know, as a, an area that has a mix yes. of everything, disappearances, extraterrestrials, UFOs, cryptids. Yeah. I mean, Bigfoot is, you know, the indigenous people of the area have tons of stories, yep. you know? So before we even get to any of that, tell me <laughs> while you're out on these excursions, have you actually ever encountered what you think is a Bigfoot or a cryptid or anything out of the norm? Like, I'm just trying to see if you've had experiences before or if you were a newbie with that sort of thing, 
going into into the show environment? Yeah, that's that's actually a great question. Um, and I, I appreciate you asking it because it's I think that gets asked a lot, but I've never really had an opportunity to speak directly to that um, mm -hmm. other than little tidbits here and there and stuff and other, you know, interviews and, and little round mm -hmm. tables. But um, right. <clears throat> so, you know, I mean, I've spent a lot of time out in the back country in these areas that I mean, you're so, so far off the, the beaten track and so far off the road system. And, you know, there's areas you can't, the, the roads aren't even close, right? You can't even drive to these areas. You just, you're just, you look at a map of Alaska and you don't have to go super far away to literally be really far away. I mean, you're right. just, maybe you're hundred, hundred air miles away from an airport yeah. or a runway, but you're, you may as well be a million miles because you're not going to walk back. You know what I mean? It's a dance. It's not, it's it's not really going to happen. Um, so mm -hmm. anyways, <clears throat> through that time, I've definitely had some experiences, but I've never had any experiences that at least I was aware of that were, you know, the cryptid um, mm -hmm. classification. It's more uh, things I've seen in the sky. Um, right. I'll just put it that way. Sure. Um, that's, that's known for it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, there's times where it's, it's kind of like, eh, you know, what's going on. And then there's other times where it's like, oh yeah, that's exactly what that is. <laughs> it's, you, know, you, just, you can't deny it. You're sitting there yeah. watching it. And it's not something I talk about. I don't really, I don't tell people really about it and talk mm -hmm. about it much. Um, so that's, that's been the bulk of my experience that way. And, um, I had, I had never been in, and this is like no offense against anybody that's really, really in the Bigfoot, but I, I was never like a Bigfoot person. I wasn't like, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm a Bigfoot guy. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it was always something I was kind of interested in because, you know, I do believe there are other things out there. I do believe there's mm -hmm. life forms that are well advanced and above us that, you know, potentially are out somewhere. And, mm -hmm. So Bigfoot's always fascinated me in the way where it's like, well, I don't know it's not real, but I don't know it is real. Mm -hmm. so I've always kind of had that that question mark, like, well, I kind of want to know if it is real, right? Yeah, me too. If it's real, it's like, <laughs> what is it? All these yeah. theories. Yeah. Right. And so this is talked up there. After after being in Portlock <clears throat> for the time that I was there, and some of the experiences I had happen, which I think yeah. are like beyond what anybody thinks of like a classic Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. I think back to some other times I've been in the wilderness and I think, well, maybe I have had experiences before. I just didn't know what I was experiencing. Right. I just, I, I didn't have that. a, I didn't yeah. have the, the sort of the purview to know what, what it mm -hmm. was that was happening. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. That's, that's, <clears throat> it's kind of freaky, but what a way to get broken in. Um, can, can you bring us into, Let's talk about Portlock, if, you know, because a lot of people haven't seen the show only because it hasn't come to their area. Right. So they really don't know. Like I, I rant and rave about this show because I, you know, for me, watching a lot of different shows, it's homework, you know, because we have a lot of people of different shows that come on and, um, there's just some shows I'm just like, I never named them, but you'll hear, really hear me bellyache about it. But I have just been on and on about this show because I it, it fascinates me, not just because Bigfoot. You know, Bigfoot shows, are they're all over the place. They really mm -hmm. are. And, and yeah. people are doing their thing, you know, to try to prove the existence, yada, yada. But it, I think it's the area itself and the history of it because it really is known as one of Alaska's mysteries. So if you can like guide us through and then we can go through that and then lead into your experience and some of the experiences of people you were with, we'll let you take it. This is well, yeah. like we say, your show. So where you, well, you want to go, we'll jump I mean, in. I don't even know where to start. Um, Anywhere you want. How you got there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a, um, man, it's, there's, there's a, there's a lot that happened and there's weird stuff that goes on with time out there. So I think, <laughs> I think what, for some people, what may, may be perceived as a 30 day experience could very likely be a 60 or 90 day experience. I mean, some days felt like they were two days long and it's just a really wow. weird anomaly. We can kind of maybe go into that a little bit, but, um, I, I was approached, um, very sort of, 
nonchalantly about bear guard service. Um, like, Hey, we need a bear guard. We've got a project going on. What's your availability like? And it's like, well, let's talk about what the scope is, what you're looking for. And it was like, well, you know, it's just, <laughs> We're going to just be doing some filming, and it was just this sort of, you know. What kind of filming? Yeah, it, <laughs> That's what I want to know. It, it was, How big um, of a bear? <laughs> yeah. it, it was, so it, it took a while for what the filming is to kind of come out. I think, you know, we mm -hmm. sort of needed to vet each other a little bit. They needed to figure out if I was real, and I needed to figure out if they were real, quite frankly. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the project was um, – there's this settlement in Port Lock, Alaska that had been abandoned and it had been abandoned most recently in like 1951. And they really didn't know why it had been abandoned, but you know, the, the villagers of Nan Wallach, they wanted to go back to this, this old town site of Port Lock and just explore around and see, see if they could figure out where the old town was and, and maybe how or if they could resettle this because their village is expanding and they need more room. And it's kind of like moving back to one of their old settlements prior to Nan Wallach ever becoming um, a formal village. And, you know, it's like, hey, it's, a, it's just really rugged, raw wilderness. You know, there's a lot of wildlife out there. We need somebody like you with your skill set. And I said, well, let me let me research the area a little bit. I, I'm familiar with it to some degree, let me, let me look at it and I'll get back to you kind of thing. And so I, I looked at it and it's like, yeah, this is great. Like sign me up, let's do it. <laughs> um, and then <laughs> I believe it was, uh, um, you know, I, so I've, I did some more research on poor lock, but I never really dug deep into figuring out really what was going on out there, what had gone out on out there. Um, and being, you know, not, not really, sort of um you know hovering in the the bigfoot space had never really crossed my um you know my radar so much but i you know i had heard things of different areas where there's you know sasquatch and bigfoot and this and that but i never really put two and two together for portlock and um i believe it was the day before we were actually leaving to go out there um they were doing just kind of a quick interview, you know, like the day before, like, Hey, let's get to know you a little bit. And then that's sort of when they dropped the whole Bigfoot thing on me uh, and let me know like, Oh, so, you know, they, the, the reason they believe these villagers got ran off is because of Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, okay. Like mm -hmm. right on. That's like, a big deal to clear a, a town. Well, <laughs> it's, it's a big deal, but you know, what's interesting is I was, just kind of like, well, I'm, whatever, I'm already committed. I'm going. So like, let's go. Let's, mm. maybe we can find it, him or her, it, whatever it is. Right. But if it's only been abandoned since the fifties, how hard could it have been? Like, this is one of the questions that had come in um, earlier. People just getting ready for you. Um, shouldn't the buildings still be there? Or, well, or is the terrain just so aggressive? It just gets overgrown and wiped out like that fast. Yeah. So like what I like, like the way I describe it is Alaska just eats things. If it's, mm. if it's man-made, Alaska just eats it. It literally just, the earth just eats it. And yeah. It, it just grows right over it. Wow. Yeah. It just the, the wood decays and it like you, you would see something that, you know, you should you'd think, oh, wow. Like in, in say, you know, Oklahoma or somewhere, there's a wooden barn that's been standing there for 200 years, you know, yeah, that's like what I mean. down, but it's, Right. still kind of there and you can tell what it is in alaska it could be mm -hmm. 20 years and it, it it just would be like eaten by the the earth more or less right. yeah exactly because <laughs> yeah. because that's a, a big thing you know because just going and watching the segment I'm like well where are the buildings because i mean i've been to some pretty you know ancient places in the world and things are standing yeah. and and here like you say like i look at this house this house here it was like 18 you know 72 Oh, wow. it's it's standing it's just like yeah so it's like oh it's been abandoned since the 50s i'm thinking <laughs> where's everything well i th i think that's kind of you know that was i think largely probably a lot of our sort of expectation going out there is right. like oh it was in the 50s and there was a school and there was a cannery and there's a sawmill and there's this and there's a post office and there's like all these you know residences yeah. and whatnot 
And I, I think without thinking too hard about it, I think I just sort of like summarized to myself that like, oh yeah, we're going to go out there and there's probably just going to be like dilapidated buildings everywhere. Mm -hmm. We get out there and we were only able to find um, instantly two structures um, like standing. You guys all saw what we call cabin one. Right. Um, And for those who haven't seen the show yet, there's a super old cabin we still haven't figured out what it is i think we we decided it was either a school or a post office but um or maybe yeah, it somebody was a else, good size for what it was yeah and maybe yeah. maybe somebody else by now knows what it is this this summer has been a complete blur for me i mean i i kind of start my season in april and it's about now before i kind of come up for a breath of air and i haven't really been fully on top of what the latest is with with the group and the um mm-hmm the crew and everything, but we only, uh, we found those two, you know, and one of them's like, you go in and you're like, man, it looks like if somebody breathed too hard, this thing could just fall over on itself with us in it. And, um, then we found remnants of another building that had been completely smashed flat. It's like the whole house just went and like, -hmm. like, or the roof just caved in and just like crushed the whole entire thing flat. Mm-hmm. We didn't see, we didn't find that so like weeks after we were there because mind you when we got there there was still a lot of snow in the woods and mm-hmm. then it snowed when we got there like a foot two feet of snow right so we were walking on top of stuff we had no idea what it was for for weeks on end there oh that's a good point do yeah. you do you know if that building collapsed from weather or if it was something that was purposely torn down. Was there any evidence um, to prove otherwise? You know, um, that's a good question because when we found it, um, you know, I, I looked it over really well and it really, it really didn't look like it was maybe, well, for, for one, um, weather, the only weather I think that could have brought that thing down would have been snow load. Mm-hmm. Um, the and the reason I say that is because it was in the woods, like deep in the woods. And it yeah. was surrounded by giant trees. And the way yeah. those, the, the way the forest is in that part of Alaska, the, the trees build almost like a weather block, like a wind mm-hmm. block. Like a shield. Like a shield, yeah. yeah. So I don't think it could have been wind per se. Um, could it mm. have been the 1964 earthquake? Potentially. Mm. Um, that that wreaked a lot of havoc all over the place. Um, but there's no accounts on on it. Yes, it was there one day and the next day after the earthquake, it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and snow load, typically when it destroys a, a building, it just caves the roof in. Like it just That's falls right. through yeah. the roof. That's right through the center. All that moisture inside then sort of rots and decays everything from the inside out. Mm-hmm. This thing, the entire roof was still intact. It just had dropped, dropped all the way to the floor and the walls were like blown out. Interesting. Wow. So, so weight again. It could it, could, it could be, like some it sort. could be, could be weight. Um, it's really hard to, to say we, that mm. was something we found relatively late in our, our mm. search out there. And we never, like, at least when I had to leave, um, we never got a lot of time to really go back and investigate it too much. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. Um, well, I, so well, let's, I'll just try it. I'm just trying to go through the segments in my in my mind. So there was a group of you guys, and you, you're basically the job was, you know, is is if it was Bigfoot, which the people believed it was, is he still active? Are there still others? You know, or is there one? Are there more? Um, and you know, are we still looking at, at an aggressive one or? Is it safe to move back in? So, upon arrival, what was the plan? How did you, how did you how does one just up and decide? Okay, let's just see if it's an aggressive Bigfoot. If we're dealing with the family, yeah. um, well, you know, it's pretty well, frightening. See, that's, that's the thing. So, I mean, ultimately, the plan was, or the 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 purpose was to go out and <clears throat> explore the old town site of Portlock um, and just see if we could figure out how a new settlement could poach potentially resettle there. Right. You know, is there a good adequate water source? Does it logistically make sense for a, a town layout? Can we find where these old buildings were? Because if the old timers put a, a building in a certain spot, it probably had a good reason for being there. Right. right. So it was kind of like, see if you can find these like potential landmarks and then, you know, map them out and then, 
get an idea like is this a feasible logistically viable area to do a new settlement that was ultimately the purpose um and you know i think there was more to it that that really i i certainly didn't know um mm -hmm. i think dj keith um and guy they probably had a little bit more because they grew up not too far from there in Nan Wallach. And, you know, this like Nuntinock Bigfoot was like regular part of their town talk, if you will. Mm -hmm. right? The culture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like don't go out when it's foggy because that's when Nuntinock will come out and get you, right. you know, like that's what, that's what the kids grew up hearing. And so that's just, it was part of their, their culture. Um, but if they believed it, like that, that it was responsible for, you know, killing so many people. I mean, you know, you evacuate entire town. People have gone missing. People are turning up dead, mutilated, yeah. you know. So I think, like, it, for me, like, at least that information was sort of, like, a little bit still under the rug. It hadn't been revealed yet right. to a large degree for those right. guys. Mm -hmm. I think it's the degree of information we ended up finding out was still well above, I think what, what they knew. Right. Um, and I think part of it was like, Hey, look, this is all things aside. This is important for our, our people, our village, our culture and everything else. Because so some of these people were, I mean, they, they lived in this village up into the fifties, right? Some of the oh, elders. Yeah, yeah. Like, so are, this is pretty new history for them. Correct. There are direct okay. descendants living in Nan Wallach that were in Portlock. Wow. So they were there like, you know, yeah. or, or they had direct relatives that are no longer with us that right. were there and they told them growing up like, oh yeah, this is what happened. So there's, there's either direct or, or second party um, right. you know, account. So yeah. So going in there, you know, it was, it was like, the plan was to try to figure this stuff out. And mm -hmm. at the same time, like it was sort of as the information was kind of trickling out, it was like, well, also <laughs> mm -hmm. well, see if anything comes around and, you know, and don't go too far into the woods. And, and, you know, I never really got these warnings until I was on site, you know, Tommy, <laughs> yeah. Tommy told the guys before they left shore there, he's just like, look guys, don't go into the woods. Like it's no joke. Like, Tommy's been studying and investigating this Nunty Nuck stuff for a really long time. And, you know, he's the real deal when it comes to knowing about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so he told them, he's like, look, just don't go in the woods. It's no man's land. Like, we just don't go in there. Like, people just do, don't do it. Mm -hmm. And I show up and I'm like, yeah. So, like, I got to go into the woods because I got to go do what I do. I got to mm -hmm. I got to look for animal sign. I got to figure out what kind of animals we're dealing with, like what mm -hmm. their travel patterns are and stuff like that. So I'm like like I have to go in there and they're just like, well, no, like you, you <laughs> well, this all just sit on the beach or the whole series. Yeah. <laughs> all so right. to no, me, it was kind of like, all right, well, I don't know why you don't want me to go in there, but it makes me want to go in there even more now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, why am I here anyway? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Because in Canada, we just got the series. And I literally ca uh, caught episode three today. Like you, I'm not a big Bigfoot follower, but I heard so many amazing things from Michelle. And I said, I have to watch it before he's on so that I get a good idea. And I love the show. I'm just going to say that straight out. I love the show. Great I idea. love that you guys brought a medium in. I, I want to know a little bit more about why the bark was missing from the trees and like this great tree in the center so high up mm -hmm. why is it missing who who removed that that's not something that comes off like, with the elements or what kind of animal what I kind mean, of animal i mean other than like a massive bear it would have to be something really large because there's some really high up you know places in that tree I don't yeah. want to give too much away for the Canadians that haven't seen it. Um, so that's still, still a mystery. Um, there's, there's a ton of speculation about it and, you know, it's not something that I've, I've seen. It's not like a, it's not like something you go out in the woods and you're like, Oh yeah, that peeled bark is this. Right. Right. 
Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not like, Oh, those holes in the tree are from a woodpecker. You know what I right. mean? It's, it's not a common thing. Um, <laughs> and so while we're out there, you know, we're like, what the heck is this? And, and of course you can't Google, right? You can't be like, well, let me go, let me go on the internet and see if I can get some ideas of what this is. So we're all kind of like, Hmm. What right. this be? And it's not, it's not like scraping bark off the roots of a tree or in that spot of the tree like that is not, it's not indicative of a bear. Bears don't do it like that. Mm-hmm. Bears scratch trees. They do it high up. They, they rub and they scrape down on the bark and they scrape it down. And you can see claw marks clearly mm-hmm. in the wood and stuff like that. There's some of these areas, this bark is peeled off, like almost like surgically it's like very clean and it's smooth and it's yeah it's very very fresh too you can see it's fresh because of the coloring of the wood under that bark we could see it like we started noticing it everywhere and then one day i'm standing there and we're we're up at the water tower and i could i had a pretty decent line of sight down to where this big tree was And I just noticed that in that line of sight, I could see several other trees down this pathway that had the the Mm. bark scraped off of it all in the same way, in the same fashion. And so as I'm sort of just sort of hypothesizing or whatever my own theories while I'm out there, I started like thinking, well, maybe these are like trail markers. These are markers Mm -hmm. for some yep. something humans sense. wouldn't do that we humans are more like we like to put things at eye level right right so we put trail markers at eye level on a tree very common one is blaze or a ribbon right tied on mm-hmm. a tree branch and yada yada or a common bl- the old school blaze is you take you know hatchet you scrape a little bark off on the side mm-hmm. of the tree you're walking towards and then the side you know so you can find your way around and so I was just like, oh, man, this is weird because you, they would line up with each other. These these bark scrapings, the trees they were on would line up with each other, like mm-hmm. like connecting right. the dots, like walk to this tree, then to that tree. then to, And so it like created this like pathway or this trail. Mm-hmm. Um, we we still don't we still don't know. Um, mm-hmm. Again, there's tons of speculation, especially when this gets out in, you know, Internet land. Oh, yeah. Everybody's, yeah. Uh, everything changes yeah yeah and everybody's mm-hmm. oh it's it's you know they haven't been out there and they're looking at this bark you know this tree on a on a tv and they're like oh it's this it's totally everybody's this. got an expert opinion yeah <laughs> the expert like, people out like there, we had yeah. a pretty we had a pretty darn good mixed group of guys with with a very very wide range of outdoor experience spanning right. all over alaska I mean, you put our combined experience together in the outdoor world and we're talking, I mean, I don't just rough hundreds of years. I mean, it's just insane how like, yeah, it's all what been, you do. It's oh, what's your environment, outdoors. right? Outdoors. Yeah. It's like, it's, mm-hmm. it's our backyard, if you will. So yeah, the bark's still a mystery. We don't, we don't really know what's going on with that yet. So you um, haven't seen anything like that before with, I'm not saying it's bears because that looked really high up to be a bear, but have you ever countries. seen anything yeah. like that? No. And, and since I've been out there, like I've made it a point to like purposely look for stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I obviously spent a lot of time in the woods and all over the place. And so I'm like, well, I don't want to walk, walk into a situation. Yeah. <laughs> well, because that episode, they were there the night before and didn't see it. Then the next day they're in the same area and all of a sudden it's everywhere. And it's like, what the hell? Like that was for me, it was like, wait a second, 24 mm-hmm. hours of laps. How did all of this happen? Or could it be that you just didn't notice it because it was dark? No, they had their cameras and they found Mm. some. I'm answering for you. Sorry. (laughs) No. no, no. That was kind (laughs) of. (laughs) That's kind of how things were out there. Um, You just like weird stuff would happen like that. But it happened immediately. Like your first night there, you guys were, you guys had like all kinds of things going on. Our first night there was completely, um, it was, it was so jacked. Um, <laughs> like that's the only way that's, just first, a, that's, that's a lot coming from point. you and your experience. You know? yeah, like, it's you're just, making it very frightening for the rest of us. <laughs> it was just, I mean, it was like, we were trying, like, I mean, we all know how to do what we're doing out there. I mean, we could have just rolled up under a tree with tarps and slept under a tree. 
you know, and we've, most of us have done that at one point or another, but like, we're trying to set this base camp tent up and like, you know, you see in the, the show, it looks like it took us five minutes. Well, we, we wrestled with that darn thing for hours and, um, <laughs> not, it's just like nothing would, nothing would work. Right. There's, there's some weird stuff <laughs> that like never got shown. It was like, something was trying to keep us from getting that tent set up. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll give you a quick example. And this wasn't shown in the in the show. And I we we really wish it would have been because all the good stuff us, that's on the cutting room floor. It it freaked us out. Like all of us were like, "Holy crap, that just happened!" And so, anyways, so the, this tent's a metal frame, and you have to like erect this frame. And then once you have the frame up, you then take this the green canvas mm -hmm. and you like pull it over. The frame and then that canvas then becomes like your tent right you guys mm -hmm. saw what the tent looked like in yeah. the show yeah um well the uh the tent fell down like the the you guys saw that in the show or maybe you haven't seen that yet but the mm -hmm. tent whoever has okay so if you haven't seen it you'll see this it's not too much of a spoiler but the tent falls down just on its own like we're standing there we're trying to set this thing up and it just completely collapses on its own and it's like okay, that's like, what, what's going on? And then we go and look and then Ash notices, oh my gosh, this pin broke. And it's like, well, how would that pin just break? Right. So I think all of us are just like, we don't care how we just want to get in a tent. It's cold. It was really, really cold that day. You can't see that, but it was mm -hmm. freezing. Mm -hmm. And there was some weather, what looked to be maybe some weather moving in. And so here's this tent. It's fallen over, like kind of, you know, a little bit of an angle. And this whole entire green canvas that was laid over the frame. Now, mind you, this was really heavy. This this green canvas took a couple of us big dudes to like move over there, yeah. unroll, and it took all of us to get it over the metal frame. Mm. But we're standing there. All of a sudden, this thing just lifts up and gets blown all the way off the frame. Oh, come it, on. Went, it went straight up and then it went, poof, off to the side. Yeah, that's not that's, weather. That's, that's I'm just going to say that right now. Yeah, and it, that's, it, that's and we're like, oh, the, you know, oh, the wind just blew it. <laughs> you know? That sounds very supernatural. <laughs> that sounds very paranormal. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's like, it wasn't just like, oh, it just blew out of the way. The thing literally rose yeah. straight up and was like floating there over the metal frame and then blew off to the side. Yeah. And that was like the only gust of wind I think we had all day, if that's what it was, right? So right. it was like, so that's something like, just didn't want you undercover somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Sure. that place is filled with elementals. <laughs> and where did and where did we where did we go for cover? Well, we went <laughs> into Port Lock into Cabin One, right? So mm. courageous. It's it's like. At that point, we were just like, look, we need a roof over, over our heads. It was like mm -hmm. the path of least resistance. You know, um, it just wasn't what was going on with that tent and stuff like that. It was just like, it was just too much going on. It was like, I, like I said, it was like everything was trying to keep us from getting that tent set up. Um, just difficulties that would not normally be a difficulty were just like, okay, this is just like bizarre at this point. Mm -hmm. And it just like drew us like to like, oh, like, let's just go over to this cabin. And then when we're in that cabin, then, you know, also, I don't want to do too many spoilers, but too much, you know, so all sorts of stuff started going on. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. the interesting thing is, um, you know, looking back on all this now and having some time to process it, we were directed and moved around within that port lock area so many times in so many ways that we didn't even realize it was happening. That's interesting. That shows like a huge degree of intelligence um, mm -hmm. going on behind the scenes. Um, here's a question from Wayne. Um, Want to get that, Amelia? Yeah, sure. Let's Thank get... you. Uh, <laughs> hi, Wayne. Queen asks a quick question regarding the monolith that was discovered as you were there. Was it actually stone or was it poured concrete? I asked because on the show, it looked pebbled like weathered cement. I thought if it was cement, it could have been an old support of sorts. Of sorts, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's actually a really great question, I'll Wayne. put it up so um, you can see it, yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a great, <laughs> it's a great question. Um, 
So um, that was our first thought. It was this must have been a support of some kind for something, some of the old uh, cannery equipment or sawmill equipment or mm. something like that. And then we started looking at it really, really close. And basically what um, Wayne is keying on to is whatever the structure is, it's really, 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 really old. I'm telling you, this thing is old. And somebody over the years, it's like they just put more plaster on it to keep it in good shape. It was like if it was almost like, okay, all the buildings in this whole entire town can just fall apart, but we're not letting this monolith fall apart. So so what he saw to us, what it looked like was like, just just imagine taking plaster, right, and plastering this thing. Mm. But the plaster was like cement. And I think that cement was newer age technology, but when Mm -hmm. you, there's areas where that plaster cement was broken off and you could see into the substrate or the structure of this monolith and you could see old river rock and you could see like layers of, of river rock, how this thing had like been built and maybe added onto over time. But the old pieces where you could see into this thing were, it was old. Um, but this you, was, but there and, was history going back to the 1700s too, with people coming hmm. in, right? Correct. Explorers and such. Do you think it dates back that far? I, I think it goes back to at least then. Yeah. Wow. I, I, I think, um, and this is just based on some different stuff you yeah. know, throughout the time out there. I, I think it might even date back into the 15 or 1600s. Oh, wow. Really? Oh my gosh. Hmm. Well, yeah. That's um, interesting. Huh. Who would be there? Well, that's what <clears throat> that's what we're hoping to start uncovering and and explaining and revealing in a season two. Right. So we don't I hope you guys there. get that. It's yeah. a really, really good show. Yeah. It's really yeah. well done. There's a lot, there's a lot of rabbit holes that we we went the proverbial rabbit holes, right? Mm-hmm. And when you think, oh, you're just leading to this obvious conclusion, it's like, nope, it spirals off into 50 other potential things. And, mm-hmm. and every time we went out to answer a question, we came back with, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 more questions. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, that that monolith was for sure old. Um, mm-hmm. I, you know, none of us, after investigating it and really studying it, we don't feel it was any kind of support structure. Mm-hmm. Um, Which is the theories, a marker maybe, or the most, I would say common popular or plausible theory is it was a marker of sorts. Um, and I was, I was even talking with my dad one time and he was like, you know, back in the, you know, 1700s and whatever, they would, they would use those markers all the time um, as like waypoints basically and he goes i bet you there's a lot more of those out there Mm -hmm. Um, and Mm -hmm. so and i believe also um at one point um jeff uh the historian on the show jeff davis he also mentioned um something about how they would like the the um the spanish or i can't remember Mm -hmm. if the spanish or the english would use those um as claim markers as well but when they're when they're bringing their ships in through a bay they could look over and they could see that and be like oh okay there's this is where we're supposed to be so it was also like a like a waypoint right. marker and that, that well you there. did find coins <clears throat> or a coin if we i'm not mistaken from from that time period which definitely proves that they were there which is fascinating yeah. um that was so- my point it was one thing that became very evident to me in watching all of these different um, segments was that you guys seem to be constantly under watch. Yeah. And that's, that's how it felt too. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, it's weird. You, as soon as you go out there, you just, it's like, mm, something's different out here. You can feel it. If you're, you know, you guys would probably like, you know, mm-hmm. really feel it <laughs> as soon right. as you got there, just tuned in so much. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, I, I go all over the place and I, I don't, you know, a few times I might walk somewhere and be like, hmm, this, it's got a di- kind of a different vibe, but I got there and I was like, man, there's something different about this place for sure. Mm-hmm. 
It's yeah. a very interesting place, Alaska. I mean, the triangle and yeah. you have the UFO thing going. We well, have Bigfoot your going. Bermuda, I mean, yeah. Bermuda it's not missing triangle. anything. No, it's true. No, it's and it's, you know, portals. it's yeah. there's a lot of, you know, you, you start really digging down into those rabbit holes, you know, and I mean, it's really almost an endless thing of the different phenomenon, the different things people have witnessed or found. I mean, it's a lot of gold in the state. Um, mm -hmm. Gold's a very sought after element. Um, Especially for a lot, by ETs. Lottery. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's ley lines and, um, mm -hmm. you know, and things that, that run through the area. I mean, it's a huge state too. So mm -hmm. it's like, it is. It is, yeah. but it is known for it. For the Alaska Triangle is known. I mean, it's very famous. A lot of people, I mean, famous politicians, you know, disappeared there. A lot of planes disappear there. People go hiking, disappear there, which, of course, could, you know, be reasoning of just dense forests. As you would know, it's easy to get lost in Alaska. But um, water cryptids and, you know, forest cryptids far beyond just Sasquatch or Bigfoot and UFO anomalies and said to be a base, you know, in, in one of the mountains and heck, even a pyramid. Like, mm -hmm. it, it's just, if there's a giant pyramid over there, that's going to just change energy of everything. That's just what, what the design of the pyramid does. But um, can you elaborate a little bit on your experiences? You know, maybe things that you've heard, because these things are known for, you know, tree tapping and, uh, anomalous lights orbs mm. things like that like any, you know how was it for you guys or the guys <laughs> all of you guys um, yeah <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> or not well you know it's okay so there's a lot of really really crazy stuff that happened out there and it's it's pretty, it, it's actually pretty difficult to unpack all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and for every crazy thing you see on the show, there's literally probably another 10 things that didn't get shown that are different. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I actually got to a point where I started creating a journal while I was out there mm -hmm. of the crazy things. Wow. And it got to the point where some days there were so many crazy things and we were so tired and so it was happening so much. I, I just stopped making entries because it was happening all the time. And I'm like, wow, when I come back after working 23 and a half hours out of my 24 hour day, like I'm going to spend an hour literally writing out the day of the crazy stuff that happened. But, um, I mean, there was, I just try to walk through it a little bit, but there was a lot of weird stuff happening. Um, I believe it's an episode two when when I went on the the little walk in the woods when it was snowing, a little bit of a blizzard and stuff like that, um, which was amazing, beautiful weather to be out in. Um, <laughs> but we were we were going to investigate a noise which sounded like to me it it sounded like the exact sound that baby black bear cubs make. The black bear cubs have this very kind of dis when you hear it and you hear you know it and it's a very distinct wine um mm. that they do to attract their the attention of their mother and usually it's them wanting to nurse it's like like right. mommy feed me right mm -hmm. um and <clears throat> i i heard that the camera crew heard it but they were like no we heard it right outside of our tent and it's like well i'm hearing it way over here in the woods and, and they're just like well we heard it here and it was freaking us out we never even fell asleep for the rest of the night and it's like, okay, let's go try to find it. And so that's when you see us going, walking around in the woods in episode two. And we're hearing this and we're hearing other sounds. We're hearing like these crazy like howls, but it's kind of like, sometimes it would be faint and you'd be like, oh my gosh, did you hear that? Or was that the wind? Cause it's like, it's, it's mm. blowing really hard and trees yeah. are blowing and creaking and all this and that. And I'm like, okay, I was so focused on this bear thing that I'm like, I don't really care about any of the other, other stuff. I just want to go find this bear. And I, I was hearing it and I'm hearing it and I'm hearing it. And I'm like, okay, it's down there. We're going to go down this ravine. We're going to kind of hook around this big debris pile. And I just know the bear's going to be right over here. Like, I just know it. 
And so I'm going to walk around in a safe way to where we can go put eyeballs on it because mm -hmm. if there's a bear around, I want to know what kind of bear, how many bears, like what's the, is a month, you know, sow with cubs. What, like, what's the situation, right? Because mm -hmm. if I end up having to defend an entire camp against said bears, I, I want to know ahead of time what I'm, what I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. and I also want to be able to mitigate that because I don't want anything bad to happen to the bears. Like mm -hmm. we're yeah. humans, we do human stuff. Animals are animals. They do animal stuff. But usually animals do things to us because of what we do as humans, if that right. makes sense, right? Absolutely. So like, what can we do to mit mitigate anything that might draw these bears in? So I'm like, anyways, long story short, I'm 100% convinced we're going to walk around this corner and there's going to be these bears there. We walk around the corner, there was nothing. The snow wasn't disturbed. There were no footprints. There was literally nothing, right? And so right after that, I'm like, okay, well, there's nothing here. The sound stopped. Let's go back. And so we're working our way back to camp and we're going through a different area. And then all of a sudden, all these crazy noise started happening, like these growl sounds and this like metal pipe banging on a metal pipe. And then mm. I got sick. Like, mm. I got this instant nausea feeling where I, it was, it just went bam and hit me like that. And I'm like, I wasn't saying anything because I'm looking around thinking, okay, mm. I'm like, <laughs> puke on camera i don't want to puke on camera but i don't want to smell, like, vomit the whole world will watch me puke uh, on camera yeah, yeah. And then i'm looking at, i'm like okay like where can i puke where they won't see me puke and i'm like all these crazy thoughts are running through my head because i'm like i'm like and you're I'm running about, out of time yeah, i'm like literally <laughs> about to puke like yeah like, here, here it comes and that's when brian niffle the producer was like kyle like what dude like what's wrong man you okay and I'm like, no, I feel like I'm going to, you know, puke my guts out right now. And all these noises are happening around us. And it's like, it got intense. And it, it like, it started happen happening in this very escalated fashion where it was like one thing, then another thing, and another thing. And it's like, before you can even think about the next thing, you're still kind of tripping out about the first thing that happened, you know? And it was like happening in very rapid sequence. And then it's like, like, I'm like, let's get out of here. And then we found ourselves in this area where it's like, there's just trees and knocked over trees and debris everywhere where I think I even made the comment on the show. I'm like, it feels like the forest is trying to trap us in here. And I had that feeling yes, like I was being <laughs> trapped and like, I kind of like, you just want to just get out of there. Right. Like you're being trapped and things are like ooh, closing mm -hmm. in on you. Mm -hmm. and it's like okay whatever put the stuff to the side let's just safely get out of here we found our way out unbeknownst to us at that time when all that craziness went down and all the noises were happening and i got sick and all that stuff um we were about 20 feet away from that that the obelisk the monolith um mm. we didn't know it at the time because it was a blizzard you couldn't really see that well it was, it had snow on it there was snow everywhere i wonder if it was a uh, marker for a ley line or like be. energy lines to make hmm. that would make sense you know if you were feeling nauseous and you you have really intense energy lines under the ground or quartz oh yeah yeah that, I, that would amp everything up it was, it was, it was crazy, you know? So we, we got out of there and everybody was safe and everybody was good. And the sounds we went in to find disappeared. They were not there. And it was sometime after that, that I started to ponder, did something make that sound purposely knowing it would draw us into the woods? And if so, why was it drawing us into the woods? Right. Mm. Why did, why did our tent fall down? And then why did we have to go sleep in that, that cabin? Um, and so that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of things that would like kind of draw us in. And then we're like, we find ourselves like in the situation and we're like, why are we here? How did we get here? Kind of thing. You're more vulnerable. Like in this? That, that's, that situation. And, um, just to keep, before we get too far ahead from it, Amelia, can you, yeah, get yes. Thank you. Wayne said, Queen, and it, he posted, he put this question up while before, you were speaking. Yeah. yeah about being sick he said quite mm -hmm. a few quite a few of you seem to get sick upset stomach this did this also affect your film crew mm -hmm. it did um and just by way of the how the crew went um you know most of the time like if it was happening to a crew member and like this is a very uncomfortable feeling like it's you're, mm -hmm. you're sick about to puke your guts out is how you feel um 
like you just want to go hide in a hole and not have anybody around you. You know what I mean? So like the film, the crew guys that are running cameras or whatever, they're, they're just like, just get away from me, leave me alone. Um, they didn't want to be bothered by it. And, and, you know, and it didn't always happen while we were filming too. That see, that's the thing, right? So we Mm -hmm. don't always have cameras rolling. So sometimes stuff would happen when the cameras aren't rolling and there, it's just, it happens so fast as you Mm -hmm. can't even go run and just grab a camera to film some guy who's about to start puking his guts out. Right, right. So it, it happened to a lot of people. And, you know, I don't want to spoil stuff, but it happened to people Mm -hmm. we brought in for the day too. Yeah. Did you, did you also like, I hear from guests that we have on that um, research and study Bigfoot, that there's also an, an odor that comes about that a lot of people talk about. Yeah. Um, I, I only had like me personally, I only had really one instance where um, I smelled something and um and that's, and that's something I, that's one of the senses I use in my bear work because in some places and some bears, bears will have um, a pretty, um, a pretty prominent odor to them. And it's, it's not, and, and it's actually a little bit of a wives tale or a myth or an urban legend that people think, oh, all bears stink. So if you smell something stinky, it's probably a bear, but actually I'll just dispel that right now. That's not true. Not all bears stink. Mm-hmm. Um so just because you did it, you don't smell something doesn't mean there's a bear around just for those of you out there in that, that those types of mm-hmm. environments. But I, I did, um, I did smell something once and I, I just kind of brushed it off. It was early on in the project where, you know, I just thought it was a dead animal somewhere. Um, mm-hmm. and the weird thing is though, like it stuck with me, like I think for the entire day, it's like, I just couldn't shake that scent. Like there's always mm-hmm. like a little bit like of a really pungent, it. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're not going nose blind, it must be nasty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'm like literally like trying to just clear my nose out. Cause I'm thinking, Oh, did somehow like, did I breathe something up that got stuck in my, my nasal <laughs> passage? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like <laughs> some of the other guys smelled stuff. Um, Keith did one day pretty, pretty bad. Like it, it freaked him out. Cause it was like this, this is what, you know, Nunty Nut Bigfoot smells like. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, going back to that, um, that experience where we did the little walk in the woods looking for the bear, you know, that was trippy and that was freaky, but to me, nothing, nothing said, oh, this is Bigfoot, right? Oh, that, that must be Bigfoot. Like, I'm just like, I don't know. There's all these crazy sounds. Like, mm-hmm. I didn't even dawn on me that maybe something could have mimicked the sound of a bear to make me mm-hmm. want to go in there. Sure. Um, the growl sound was tr- really trippy and everybody heard it you can see some you can see some scenes in episode two where they show the producers and stuff and they're they're just like Mm -hmm. like eyes wide open kind of freaked out like what was that because it sounded it was like a it wasn't a growl of a bear and they may have thought that was a bear growl to me it was like a demon growl i was just gonna say was it demonic because that's that stays with you Yeah, that's that's of those recordings are yeah. terrifying. It yeah. was, it was, you know, bears don't growl like, you know, they don't, no, bears no. don't have a growl like that. But a lot of people no. think they do because in Hollywood movies, mm-hmm. they will portray that sound connected to a bear. And it's, it's all in our psyche now from, from movies. Yeah, and stuff. Hollywood gets a lot wrong. They do that with mm-hmm. demonics as well. Mm. No, yeah, they, and, like, so we've got hours of that stuff. There's no mistake in what they are. Um, you guys actually, without giving too much away, brought in um, even, I mean, you covered all your bases with mediums and remote viewers and um, paranormal investigators. Um, Did you feel that they, they helped you going in, especially the investigators, you know, because they tried to assist and cleanse and appease. Did you find that helpful? You know, because I mean, you seem to go through everything just, I mean, what do you do in a situation like that? You bring in wherever you can. And you guys did. You brought in a lot of people on many different levels. But did anybody really answer any questions for you? Um, you know, it's 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 hard to it's hard to say in what regard um, mm. if or how certain people helped. Um 
you but know, I, mean, I, I did you get I, some questions answered? You know, did it make sense? Yeah, to we you? definitely we got yeah. some questions answered. And in, in, like when when Polly, the medium was there, mm -hmm. um, she it was actually like there's a lot of there. She was there for um, for an entire day with us. And mm -hmm. um, so we had a lot of time to talk. We had a lot of time to go over stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that, of course, isn't shown um, in mm -hmm. episodes, but there was a lot of stuff happening that only us knew about. Um, and we all had like our own experiences happening to us individually that we never really shared with each other while we were out there. Mm -hmm. um, so we had that sort of data in our minds too. Was and that on purpose or was that something that you were like, just uncomfortable talking about? Um, I think a little, it, yeah, it's, I think it was kind of like some of us didn't really know it even happened. If that makes okay. sense. Yeah, um, it does. And some of us did know it happened and it was like, okay, I don't know if I want to tell anybody about this because it sounds mm -hmm. just too batshit crazy. Pardon right. me. Yeah. It's language, but, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. Um, and so when Polly came out, she was she just started like rolling the stuff out and talking about stuff. And there's times we're just like light bulb, light bulb, light bulb, ding 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 ding. Yeah. She was connecting dots for us that we didn't know how or if if we could connect. And she was just seeing and bringing things up, and she's just spewing out whatever it was she was seeing or 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 getting. And it was stuff that there's like no way she could ever know anything about. Like she was talking about stuff that like happened the night before, um, and like we didn't know what it meant. Like there's these things happening that. And it's hard to really say without spoiling or spoiling. Mm -hmm. Sure, things, but, sure. Um, there's things that happen that we didn't know what it meant. And then she talked about it and we're just like, holy crap, that's what mm -hmm. that is, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and this whole time, of course, is me being this sort of like inquisitive explorer. Um, I started just sort of theorize like coming up with my own sort of ideas and theories about maybe what's going on out there where how it could be originating and things like that so i got the opportunity to ask her some very vague questions that she'd have no idea why i was asking it mm -hmm. and the answers she gave back to me were like confirmations of what i was already thinking about um so that that was interesting and i i do feel that she really helped clear and cleanse the energy not only within a lot of us but also in the area um mm -hmm. i think i think a lot of us you know generally who allow at least allowed themselves to be open to that felt maybe a little bit more lighter and maybe a little bit less tense and then some so, some of the areas just felt a little bit more comfortable to be in um I that. can see that because when you're doing cleansings like that, you're dealing with um, a lot of earth spirits and things of that nature. Energy, everything is about frequency and vibration. Everything has an energy. Trees have an energy. You know, um, if, if there's upset going on, you want to try to calm it down. Right. We're energy. So you're going to go in there and you're going to completely meld with all of that stuff. So if you're walking into, you know, a crazy environment, that's what you're, that's what you're going to take in. Mm. And you're yeah, highly it, intuitive because of what you do. So, yeah. And you probably didn't yeah. realize that until this, right? No, I don't. I, I mean, yeah, I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, so I got um, it. Yeah. Until this yeah. experience, you didn't realize how intuitive you really were. Yeah. And, and, and in some regards, maybe I still don't. Um, but it's, uh, you know, um, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting thing. Um, and, and I think the other person that that really helped um, was Ron Moore. Oh, um, he's coming on the show in October. Yeah, he he's very I think what what like Ron is Ron's amazing. Um mm -hmm. Like this guy is, it's like, he is the go-to guy with, with the, I want to say <clears throat> like the energy side of, of these entities and stuff like yes. that. Like he really has a very profound um, grasp and idea on 
on on just what they are. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure he'll, you guys know, or he'll tell you all about that. But yeah, well, he works with a lot but, of quantum stuff, and that's that's that yeah, makes complete and, sense. Even watching see, him, he just yeah, knew what, that's that, that's that, that's that. Yeah, mm. and that's like to me, like like everything he was saying to me just resonated on a completely different level because I just didn't see like Bigfoot or whatever's out there being just this physical hairy being, you mm. know, um, that's this thing that just, you know, is just walking around making footprints in the ground all the time. Um, and he started talking about just <clears throat> how it can travel between dimensions and sort of the Absolutely. quantum energy portals, everything. Yeah. And then he went into, yeah, portals. And then he starts yeah. talking about the infrasound and how the infrasound can make you sick. And then this and that. <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. That right there. Yeah. yeah. That's huge. Yeah. 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 And it's just the dimensional side of it. Um, <clears throat> and just the energy side of it resonated a lot more with me. And so I became very, very intrigued at that point. And Ron just laid it out to us. He's like, look, guys, you know, I've been, I've been studying these things for over 50 years. <laughs> I've heard them. I've seen them. I've got audio recordings of them. And I'm just going to tell you right now, they're out here. And mm -hmm. I think for a lot of us, it was, it was almost like a relief. It was like, okay, we, we, ha we kind of know, we know something now, right. right? Right. Whether it freaks you out or not, I don't know, but like, at least we know something we know, like mm -hmm. Ron, Ron, like he's saying they're out here. I'm like, who am I to say? No, they're not. Right. Yeah, like, one of the most like versed people on the topic standing in front of you. If he says yeah. they're out there, you have to assume that he knows what he's talking about, which is a validation in a way for you guys and all of these experiences on so many different levels. Would yeah, that absolutely. be along the lines of what you went through? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah. prior prior to him coming out, we did hear some tree knocks. Um, yeah. To me, that was like the first real thing that I was like, wow. Like getting sick, the growls and all this and that was all super weird and trippy. But the tree knock thing was bizarre. Like it, it's just very, very intense. And that was like, okay, 100% we are full on dealing with something you know, along the lines of what, what people are saying. Um, but when Ron's like validating, yeah, they're out here. Like I'm, I'm like 100% convinced they're out here. And then that mm -hmm. night, you know, he, he decides he wants to play the, the language, the recorded <laughs> language. That was amazing. So he's working the communication <clears throat> angle. That's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. Well, cause I mean, I had never, you know, he's got CDs and, you know, audio or like whatever. He's got audio recordings, like, like just hours and hours and hours of audio of Sasquatch. And they're like communicating with each other and this and that. And I had never heard it. So when he's playing it, I had no idea what to expect. And like, he starts playing it, like the hair on the back of my neck standing up. And mind you, the way he's playing this is a giant speaker like kind of a speaker oh, yeah. you'd, you'd have at a concert. I haven't seen that yet. I haven't seen that one yet. I can't, we're, yet. I can't we're, imagine. We're standing by cabin one and he's playing it into the trees. Yeah. And we, he plays one and he plays another one. And I'm a, like, I'm just, of course, like I'm looking around like, okay, what's going to happen? I need a bigger gun. <laughs> yeah. <And> then, <laughs> he's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to play this next one for you. But I want you guys to know that that you know the last time somebody played this, they actually got charged by Sasquatches. Oh, no way. Yeah. Was he yeah. was being honest? He was yeah, exaggerating. He's one hundred percent. He's like, just be ready. And he's like, if if they charge, he's like, don't be scared. He's like, just stay put. Don't shine flashlights on them. Like he's like just walking us through. Like I would have pooped myself. How to? Yeah. <laughs> so. He's like, we're all kind of looking at all the us guys in the crew are kind of looking at each other like, uh oh, like what's gonna happen now, oh, right? God. And, Who invited like, this guy again yeah. to the party? <laughs> Who's right. Ron Moore? Um, Somebody hit him with a tranquilizer gun. Yeah, <laughs> get him down, make him stop talking. Yeah. So so he plays it, and I mean, 
Like, I don't know how much I could say because I don't want to spoil this for folks. No, it's okay. I mean, the United States have seen it, yeah, right? It's playing in Canada yeah. now. It's on the fourth episode now in Canada. So Okay, cool. Well, yeah. if anything, if anything, if you guys, whoever has They'll want to watch it. They'll want to watch it. Don't worry about it. You yeah, telling right. the story and then actually watching it is it, just, yeah. it's, a, it's an even better experience for them. It'll make yeah, them want so, to watch the yeah. show. So he plays, he plays this. And of course, you know, it's, it's loud. It's really, really loud. And I mean, for sure, if there's anything within miles, they heard this, you know, and he gets done playing it and we're just kind of like waiting. We're just like, okay, is it coming from those trees? Is it coming from, we're just kind of like, you know, like, where's this thing going to come from? And then a giant rock gets thrown over by the sky. <laughs> the rock. They um, left this girl rocks. And yeah. we could hear it thump, like you could almost like feel the ground, like you know, like that when when something mm -hmm. hits the ground, you kind of you feel that that thump, and like we heard it, and we didn't really know what it was, but guy guy was standing a little ways away from like where I was, and he's like, guys, he goes like, a rock just got thrown, and we we're all kind of like, oh my gosh, that's what that sound or that feeling was, and before we could even really gather our senses to like sort of comprehend that a rock just got thrown at us. We started hearing all these crazy, crazy sounds, um, sounds of an old creaky wooden door opening and closing, but it was like coming from the trees. And it was oh, really high oh up. that is just bizarre. And it was Fantasy. really loud. And it was like, you know, like, and it would keep doing it. And then there was like these knocking sounds and then these just weird other sounds. I don't know how to describe. And we're all just kind of like, oh my gosh, are you hearing that? And everybody's looking at everybody. The crew's looking at each other. They're looking at us. We're looking at them. And Ron's just standing there with this big smile on his face. I'm pretty sure he is. It's like, yeah. He kind of like, yeah. Um, so that's, and then sorry. We're just, we're, we're at that point, we're, we're hearing these sounds and, and we're like, they kept going. Like it, it was like a sound session. It, I don't know how long it really actually lasted but it felt like it was forever normally we would hear something and it would be like oh did you hear that and then it was gone or maybe you'd hear one more thing this thing kept making noises for like five or ten minutes um hmm, that's substantial yeah and then so after after we got done if you will in that area um before we left we're kind of cleaning our stuff up we're getting the speaker and you know and and some equipment stuff like that and we're still over by the cabin um the brian the producer said hey let, let's just let's just ask you a couple questions real quick you know about what just happened um and so they're they're interviewing me and as they're interviewing me you know the i'm standing here and the camera guys are like you know opposite from me looking directly at me and i something out of the corner of my eye kept kept you know, catching and I'm seeing something, but I'm trying not to pay attention too much to it. Cause I'm like, these guys are asking me questions and I'm trying to articulate answers back to them. <laughs> and all of a sudden I look, cause this, this thing that was catching my eye was getting larger. And so I just like, I'm looking now and this ball of light comes floating out of this tree. And as it's floating out from the tree, as soon as I went, there's a ball of light right there. It went poof and it was gone. Holy and crap. as that, like, as I said that, Alex, the, the main, the, one of the camera guys is like flipping around to try to like catch it on camera, but he's turning his head first to do it. And he saw it as well. Um, and, wow. and it literally, it was crazy because it's like this, it's a ball of light. I would, I would say like from what it looked to me about the size of a basketball, um, it's an orb yeah the whitest brightest light like you can imagine mm -hmm. but it wasn't radiating any light so what yeah. i mean by that it wasn't shining light on it no it was just there it was but there it they, was like, they're common know, around bigfoot sightings and ron wasn't there he had already gone back to camp of course. um yeah. and <laughs> so i had told him about Freaking that ron. <laughs> and, he's, and he said he, ron's like oh yeah he's like that's that was probably Bigfoot leaving. Like that was its energy. <laughs> it's energy or a portal. We're going to hold that 
No, no yeah, it's sponsored, yeah. It, okay. Otherwise, we are in trouble. This is the fun part of our job. This is our job. job. <laughs> this is, yeah. this is yeah, yeah, this is why we're here. <laughs> you are listening to The Outer Realm with Michelle DeRoche and Amelia Pizzano coming to you live from on 105.3 FM radio from the gorgeous city of New Orleans. Tonight's guest is Kyle McDowell, and he is here from the show Alaskan Killer Bigfoot. If you haven't seen it, you have to search it, look for it, find it. It's worth it. It is so different and so refreshing, and it's more than just Bigfoot. So, shout out and thank you to the amazing people at Folgers Coffee for sponsoring our show from day one. Thank you for your support and your continuing sponsorship, Folgers. We love you. No one loves you more than Michelle and I. A huge thank you for our intro and outro to Dr. Snick, the sonic surgeon, Justin Snicker, award-winning composer and musician. You can find his music on Amazon and Bandcamp and follow him on Facebook and Instagram. He just dropped his Halloween album on Bandcamp. So it's only on Bandcamp right now. So if you're interested, check him out. Stream or listen to our archives on the platform you normally use. Please remember to subscribe and like us too, especially if you're listening right now. And just a reminder, the majority of our audience, of course, being FM, is audio. So we try to be as descriptive as we can because we know we have all these amazing international listeners for real. So thank you all from around the world for joining us this evening. So Kyle, let's pick up where we left off. So, okay. How does one go to sleep after that? <laughs> I'd like to know. Or well, not go to see, sleep. That's, that's the, that's the great thing about being a bear guard because you never sleep. So uh, you, don't, you don't have to worry yeah. about that part. Right. You're ready for the paranormal. You were like born ready. If you're not yeah. sleeping, you're ready for this. <laughs> so that's, you know, there's, there's duties beyond, you know, like my, I'm there to, 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 you know, look over the camp and the people and whatnot. So a lot of times when we would get done after filming for, you know, 12, 14, 16 hour days or something like that, I still had other duties to do. And when we all did too, I am not certainly um, solo in that. I mean, we had firewood, we had to split, we had logs, we had to cut, we had food, we had to make. I mean, there was a lot of work to be done. I mean, we're all a bunch of people out living in the wilderness, um, and whatnot, but anyways, um, yeah, it, it's, it, you, you kind of like, I was, I, re I remember I was very, I was very amped up. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was kind of like, like, and I even said, I believe in the interview, something to the effect, like, you know, what the F did we just do? Right. I know, like, you did. I know. Like, what, what did we just, <laughs> what kind of thing did we just open that we, we maybe can't close? Right. Um, is there, is there a reason that you guys were there in the spring? Is there more sightings when it comes to springtime or wouldn't like, it would be much more comfortable if you were there in July. Right. So, oh, um, um, I would think black flies would be horrific. You know, it, yes, I, forest probably has that all going at all times, though. Yeah, Alaska. Um, Alaska's just rough. Like it doesn't matter when you're here. Um, you know, I don't. I don't know that the the reason we were there had anything to do with the frequency of sightings. I, I'm not aware of. <laughs> anything like oh and in, in march it's a great time to go see bigfoot or anything like that um mm -hmm. i think it's just how it happened to work out with everybody's schedule i mean we had a okay. 10 12 people out there mm -hmm. um and logistically like you don't just roll out there it's not an easy place to get to um whether you're going by plane or boat which mm -hmm. are the only two ways to get there pretty remote. um both of those modes of travel create some some pretty significant challenges um weather high seas there's crazy tidal fluctuations that roll in through that part of alaska um you can have some very very um you know big big water big oceans big waves whatever um mm -hmm. i don't i don't know but you know we <clears throat> we got every every season of weather within a matter of a couple of weeks out there, we had a blizzard. We had like the day before that blizzard, we were wearing t-shirts like at one point. Like, we no, were it's like kind of like living in Ontario. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and then it's a blizzard. And then, you know, a few yeah. days later we're swimming in the ocean and it's yeah. just, it's like insane. Um, you know, looking back on it though, I think 
that's a really sweet time to go. Personally, I think another really good time to go would be like this time right now in the fall, September, October. Mm. Um, because you just like, so you have to imagine like th- we have so much daylight, we have so much rain and stuff like that in the summertime that plants and vegetation grow very, very large. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a lot of the, the wooded areas we we're walking around in that you probably wouldn't really be able to go walk around in it and say mid to late July because the okay, vegetation so was so Yeah, huge. that makes sense. Devil's mm-hmm. Club. And it was actually really nice like in the spring like that because no, there hadn't been really any new growth. So you could see a really long ways through the woods. Mm-hmm. Uh, or in the summertime, you may only see 10 feet, right? Or five right. feet. Right. Um, so it was actually, uh, I think it was, it was a really good time to be there. Um, and then the fall would be good because it would sort of have the opposite side of that. Mm-hmm. The weeds would be dying and, and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. you'd have still that more clear line of sight, but, um, I'd actually, and I've, I've been kind of, you know, campaigning a little bit with the guys. I'd, I'd love to go back in the winter sometime. Um, mm-hmm. I think just from a tracking perspective, it would be really cool. Probably Mm -hmm. easier, right? Yeah, because when the winter, when it's the winter time, you can start to make defined paths. You can say, "Look, if we're going to walk from here to here, we're only going to walk on this path, so we can we can control the tracks, right?" Right. Um, If you just have people haphazardly just walking around everywhere, well, you never know if there's really any new tracks. Yeah, Um, that's true. That's true. Yeah, so you can kind of create a trail system, if you will, and then look Mm. for new things in and around that trail system. So I think it'd be, excuse me, I think it'd be pretty cool that way. And of course, since your show, I've caught wind recently, I think I just read something probably on um, your group page, actually, and I won't name names. I don't, I'm going to do that, but there's looking like there's another already established show looking to look for Bigfoot in Alaska now. What? On the heels of your show. No. Yeah. Um. I, it's interesting. You mentioned that I actually just heard that today. Like just, I was like, Hmm, yeah. I don't believe in coincidences. So, um, I found <laughs> that rather interesting, but, um, I mean, with all the experiences you were having, it was bound to happen, right? right. Somebody else is going to want in on that. Um, so <clears throat> you guys built another building you decided we're going to build something brand new and see if it's still here when we get back. What was the purpose of that? Well, there, so there were, there were actually two structures that, that were built. Um, the first one is the, the Banya. Um, the right. Banya is, is a, right. it's basically a steam room, like a yes. sauna slash steam room. It's, it's something that's traditional in, um, in, in the culture of, um, Nan Wallach and, and their, their lineage and stuff like that. And those guys, they, they, you know, Keith was the, the ringleader for the Banya. He really, really wanted to build this Banya. He was kind of like, you know what, we're building one. I don't care what anybody <laughs> says. I don't care what anybody Speaking wants. Big foot, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. We're building, we're building the dang Banya, you know, and, <laughs> and I'm like, what is it? And it's, it's like a steam room kind of sauna thing. And it's like, dude, they're amazing. I'm like, okay, cool. Like okay, you guys, you guys build it like awesome. And then when he actually built it and I used it, I was like, oh my gosh, this thing is so awesome. Like, I'm so <laughs> glad you built this thing. And I'm right. like, I'm going to build one in my yard someday. You're going to come over and help me. So anyways, <laughs> we, we built a Banya. Um, and, you know, it's a pretty crude structure. You know, you mm-hmm. cut trees and I mean, it's like very crude. Mm-hmm. And then, um, then they built um, a cabin and, um, you know, sadly, most of that was done after I was actually gone. So I didn't get to see the finished, um, oh, finished so uh, cabin because I had left all. Oops, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, I did not get to see the the final cabin piece. Mm. So the idea was to see if they're still there when you go back. I imagine. Well, I mean the the, the I mean the main purpose. I mean building a cabin out there for one's not easy, right? So mm-hmm. all the lumber, the materials, the tools, everything had to be brought out yes. um, on a boat, and it had mm-hmm. to come a really long ways on a boat. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. it's already expensive to buy lumber and stuff here in Alaska. So it's it was built with like okay, like we've been here for a while. Um, let's build something and let's start to kind of put our stake in the ground a little bit and start Mm -hmm. sort of our, 
it's a very symbolic sort of measure to say we're resettling Portlock. Yes. Here's our first cabin, right? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic. And so that's what it was. And it was very, very well built. You know, it's, it's, you know, built by a really rugged, hardy Laskins that knew what they were doing. And, <laughs> um, you know yeah. how to make things last as long as you can in Alaska. So um, I, I think maybe a sub purpose of it was, also, well, let's see what happens when you build it. Season two, just saying, anybody listening out there who's in control of this stuff. Um, so I guess I, I want to tie it into Wayne's question, but I want mm. to, I mean, when you go through this experience, I'd like to know if an extension of his question, if the mindset or your or your emotional state of mind, all of this um, continued on. I mean, I get PTSD after listening to this stuff, Ron Moorhead, I'm just putting out there seriously. Right. <laughs> but this is what um, Wayne's question was. I'm gonna yeah, go thank you. How was everyone's emotional state during the time you were there? There was the physical feeling of being unwell, but I'm curious if this extended to an emotional or mental state as well, which is an excellent question. I'm guessing I'm asking if anyone suddenly acted completely out of character. Hmm. Um, yeah, so large in part, um, you know, I, I think everybody pretty much maintained, you know, the same, the same mental capacity that they, they arrived with. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a weird thing that happens <clears throat> when you go out in these environments and you're living in these environments. Um, you just kind of click into a different mode where it's like, you know, you don't whine and complain about stuff. If something's got to be done, you just do it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how hard it is or how long it's going to take. You just, you just do it. So you, you kind of already, click into this tougher state of just this, this tougher mental state mm. uh, more more of a durable mental state i guess is is how i would phrase it so we're already operating with that durable mindset and it's kind of like you get to a point where you're like i don't you just don't care what gets thrown at you you're just you're just going to take it on and just deal with it um so i think we we all had that mindset going in and some people developed it a little bit slower or it took some people to kind of, you know, snap into that maybe a little bit longer, but at some point or another, we were all there. Um, and you know, we're a band of brothers at that point. And it's like, we're, we've got each other's backs and our survival is dependent on each other. And so you're, you're in this very unique situational awareness. Um, you're in this very unique mindset where you truly do rely on, on who you're with and they rely on you. And, and so, um, I wouldn't say maybe, yeah, I wouldn't really say anybody that I was with there, um, for the duration I was with really, really had changed or started to act out of character at all. Okay. Very good. So, I mean, basically, um, only because I know there were, I mean, I don't want to give anything away, but I know that um, I guess one of the guys at some point kind of goes, mm, and right then we have a bit of a character change. Yeah. And that's, I was kind of maybe dodging around that a little bit just for yeah, yeah. the sake yeah. of um, spoiler. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, we didn't um, catch on at all. <laughs> but it catches on a little bit to, I guess, the, the state of mind. I would imagine, like you say, you're out in that environment. It is very easy to let your mind run away with you, right? Like you can easily, totally just let it go. Like things could just get the best of you. You're out of your environment. You are in a space that's completely unconfined. I know this from um, being in the haunted forest of Romania, the most haunted forest in the world. It's got a Bermuda Triangle. It has all of that. It's the craziest place ever. There aren't even any, like in the, this specific area, no birds, no animals. I mean, nothing. Wow. And uh, yeah, That's you want to talk about feeling it being watched? Very easy to let your mind run away with you. So I imagine this would be the same sort of environment considering why you're actually there. 
and you have all these crazy sounds going on around you at any given time, the feeling of being watched, all of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, personally, I never had that that happen, but I, I think it's... Um, but you're used to it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of... There's no... In, in like the experience I, I have and just what I do, I mean, I, I spend more time in the outdoors than the mm -hmm. average person. And, and mm -hmm. not only am I spending it outdoors, I'm spending it in very difficult, challenging, austere environments. Um, and I've been in a lot of very, very difficult, crazy situations. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that lends itself to basically being able to keep, keep myself together, keep my composure right. um, and just sort of, you know, rather than freak out, just like, okay, what, what do I need to analyze and figure out, adapt mm -hmm. and overcome? kind of situation um for the the untrained for the unexperienced um that place could certainly have you like digging a hole and jumping in and hiding in it and, and curling up in the fetal position sure. crying to your mommy <laughs> kind of think. thing um, <laughs> rocks <laughs> being hurled at you yeah it's, orbs floating around <laughs> i'd be in a fetal position just camping <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's definitely um you know, there's definitely a few times where I think it's fair to say we all asked ourselves and, and we even asked each other, what in the F are we doing? Here right now? <laughs> Who thought this was a good idea? Why yeah. are, Let's like, lynch him. What are we doing? That was right. going to be my next question. Did you, did you think, <laughs> what did I get myself into? Um, I don't know if I thought, what did I get myself into so much? Because um, then it's like, you kind of have to find your way out of it. Right. Um, and right. that sort of degrades the process of just dealing with what you need to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, rather than trying to just deal with what you need to deal with, you're trying to figure out how to like not deal with it. Right. And get away mm -hmm. from it. Right. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say like, what did I get myself into more like, um, this is a, like, we were finding out information while we were out there, like right. stuff that we had no idea about, like, you know, uh, Keith and, um, Ash went back to Homer. They met with this story and Jeff Davis while well, DJ and I stayed back, um, in Portlock and Jeff just rolled out this, like the information he came up with and the research he did the stuff he came up with was just like mind blowing. And so then Keith and Ash come back with that information and they're telling us that stuff. <laughs> We're just like, yeah, this, you know, like the Spaniard showed up and they, everybody got sick and people were dying and you know, they had to leave. And like, mm -hmm. I might be wrong in that. I apologize. I don't know if it was the Spaniards. Or I think not. it was, I think it might've been. Yeah. And wow. one of the expeditions English. showed up and instantly people yeah. were getting so sick. They were dying. Mm -hmm. uh, he's talking about the the uh, proclamation ceremony that the yeah. I believe it was the S Spaniards did, and um, just going on and on and on and on. And I mean, he was showing them pictures and stuff like that. And what was really really crazy, and I don't I don't think this got shown in the show, but he came up with a picture that it was one of the the expedition members and i don't know if it was one of captain cooks or nathaniel portlock's expeditions or one of the spaniards i don't recall who but they they had a a painting of the natives they encountered when they arrived in portlock mm. so it's it's like their 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 rendition of of what they were seeing right and he gave us this picture to keith and keith's looking at it and he's like this has no resemblance to our our native culture or our lineage at all. So that's way so this, before. Mm. Way, back. way before, or were those people from somewhere else? Right. Um, wow. Wow. So wow. that that was pretty trippy. And so we're like, yes. we're finding this out while we're in Portlock, completely alone, <laughs> sitting around yeah. a campfire, and Keith and Ash are telling us all this stuff that that jeff had told them and you know the big giants grabbing people and ripping their heads off and then eating them and stuff and like yes. just crazy stuff and we're just yes. like and like how many people actually disappeared or the mutilated mm -hmm. bodies they found and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so then we're kind of like, mm-hmm. like <laughs> we're here. Why? Yeah, yeah like, <laughs> the bodies in the water. Remind too. me again yeah. why I decided to come yeah. on this gig. Yeah, that's 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 intense stuff. So you guys all left there with um, the determination, and and you've decided that yes, they exist. Well, now, part two. What are you hoping to accomplish if you're given season two? Yeah. So, you know, and real quick on that, on your comment, um, you know, and I'll just say it, I've said it, I've said it before. Like, I don't know. I don't know what's in Port Lock. I don't know right. what it is, but I do know that there is something. There is something. Or I just some don't things. know. Right? Some things. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, don't know, could be more. I don't know what it is because I did not see a physical thing walk up to me and be like hey this is who I, this is what i am right i didn't see a big hairy ape-like creature go running through the bushes or anything but mm-hmm. we had so much crazy stuff happen so many bizarre like just physical things thing stuff mm-hmm. happening that all i can say is yes i know there there i don't know what it is but i know there is 100 something out there mm-hmm. um our our intention to so we of course we left there with a gazillion questions on unanswered right right? Mm -hmm. Right. we still and and some of those questions surround the original reason we went out there which was to figure out the old town site of portlock there's still areas we never got into to research um Mm -hmm. we were finding stuff in areas that were not on maps that there was no plausible reason why something would have been in an area we were finding it in. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not documented. It's not mapped. And we're like, why would this be here? Right. So like, Mm -hmm. we kind of like, we, we want to figure that out. So there's still a lot of research that we want to figure out about the the original project and plan of going out there, Port Lock town site, and can it be resettled and how viable is it, you know, to bring, you know, modern villagers out there in in this day and age and then of course we have about eight million questions surrounding whatever it is that's out there um Mm -hmm. and you know i just i want to remind the folks that have seen the show or people that haven't seen the show we're not scientists we're not professional investigators um we don't have dna sampling equipment with us we don't have geiger counters we don't have whatever 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 um we didn't go out there specifically looking for bigfoot Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't go out there on a scientific expedition to study bigfoot we went out there to try to figure out the town site of portlock um and by way of doing that we we just kind of became these uh um these individuals um that Mm -hmm. started stumbling upon all these weird phenomenons and things going on out there um Mm -hmm. So now that we have had those experiences and we know some of these different areas that haven't been fully explored or researched now going back, we're like, okay, like let's take some of this equipment. Let's, let's we'll do be ready. Stuff. Let's right? bring, you know what let's, to expect. Yeah. Let's bring some of the people in that might be specialists in this particular area um, that could really tell us what's going on with, you know, why, why are people getting sick in this one area? What, what's going on? Like, we don't have mm-hmm. magnetometers and yeah, right. counters and things like that to figure out this stuff. Is there a ley line that's, that's, you know, disturbing mm-hmm. the energy or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of still a twofold thing, um, is get out there and still, you know, really mm-hmm. see if it's a viable opportunity to relocate some of these villagers from Nan Wallach. Um, create a new community out there because that's that's ultimately the purpose while we were out there they they are mm-hmm. in a village that is over overgrown they've it's a little shelf of land between a mountain and an ocean and there's only so much room to build um you know they're 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 running out of room to to keep growing and, and building. this is their land at the and this end is of the their day. this is their land i mean they've yeah. lived there they're they're that that culture that lineage lived there before they went to Nan Wallach, they, they sort of moved their way around this peninsula, if you will, and settled finally in, in Nan Wallach. Um, so that's a, a real legitimate reason to get back out there is to mm-hmm. figure this out for them, for their, for their village, for their people. Um, but of course, with all that nutty, crazy stuff that happened, 
you know, we mm -hmm. want to we want to keep peeling the layers of the onion back. And there is some stuff that we found um, that nobody has seen yet. And there is some stuff that happened that nobody's seen or heard of yet that we want to be able to reveal um, mm -hmm. in a season two. And we also want to be able to um, dive a little bit deeper and pull a few more threads on those things, too, to see to see what we can we can continue to uncover. Absolutely. I mean, who do I call to petition? <laughs> Wayne, well, Wayne, Wayne says, take Ma Michelle and Amelia with you next time you go out. <laughs> oh, we'll get your stuff set or figure it out. Believe yeah, me, let's, we will. I mean, let's, let's go. You, For you sure. guys, you guys would, you guys would love it out there. <laughs> oh, oh, I love, oh I love it. I love that sort of stuff. Well, I, I, I'll, I I'll, need I'll a tell building. You. Yeah, um, one I'll, of those you, can is a steam bath thingy over there that you can hang yeah. out in. <laughs> uh, my hair would be so frizzy. I'm just not. <laughs> no, I, I'll tell you though, like all all craziness aside, out there, like it is, it is like hands down one of the most beautiful areas. Oh, it, Alaska's beautiful. I, it's, you it's know, magical. The, I just the, thought the first time I'd see it would be from like a cruise ship or something. Yeah, and that's that's how a lot of people <laughs> first come to Alaska. Around, you know? Yeah, my brother uh, a, did it. It's he the best it. way to see it. So, <laughs> yeah. would you consider doing big, um, you know, expeditions for um, big but bigfoot enthusiasts? I'm sorry, what was the question? Would you consider in your business now including expanding your business into um, bringing out bigfoot enthusiasts who are want to safely go and look? Um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there we especially. Go, guys. There we go. Yeah, especially especially having the experience I had, you know, it, it really opened up to my eye, my opened my eyes up to the whole, you know, cryptid world, if you will, mm -hmm. and the Bigfoot community. And I mean, you know, as soon as I met Ron and started talking with him, I just instantly became much more interested in that, just based on the conversations we had, and and again how that resonated with me on on some different levels, but. So of course, afterwards, you know, um, I started looking into things a lot more, um, and became much more involved in sort of the, the cryptid, you know, Bigfoot world and community and stuff like that, and, and did a lot more research on my own, um, and also had some other interesting experiences on my own outside of Port Lock, mind you. Um, mm -hmm. And as Ron mentioned, he's like, sometimes you open up doors and other things start happening when you do it. And I'm like, well, I apparently I opened a door because um, I have had some pretty weird stuff happen since then. Oh, um, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, to share? <laughs> well, no, it's leave me us. alone. No, it's just for real. <laughs> I mean, so what one of the one of the weird things I had happen is I actually had um, a rock thrown at me in the middle of of nowhere. Um and I mean, there was, there was no one else around. I was by myself. I was just out doing some just personal, just personal time exploring and checking Has that ever some happened stuff. to you before Portlock? No. So you got a little bullseye on your back now. Yeah. And it, they it, communicate apparently. Well, so my first, so my first thought was, holy crap, a rock just got thrown at me. <laughs> I'm like, this is in, in my, so my adrenaline's like pumping. Right. I'm like, yes. Whoa, like yes. and then, then I'm like, okay, but it didn't hit me. Right. Try to rock, scare you maybe, or just get your rock, attention. Yeah. The rock didn't hit me. And so uh -huh. I walked over to try to figure out, I wanted to see the rock and try to find it. And it was like a, it was like a good sized rock. It made a pretty good thump. And so then I'm like, you know, there's, sort of you know getting back into the the skeptic side of me i'm like okay like is there somebody out here that just happened to be excuse me out here before i got out here and they're maybe hiding but i'm i'm in a remote area i mean there's no cell service where i'm at and i'm a long distance off the road i had hiked back into this area and i walked around and see any sign or tracks of anybody or anything like that and there's certainly no animal i'm aware of um regular animals were aware of that, that can throw rocks. Um, <laughs> I didn't see anything, but yeah, that was, that was pretty crazy. Um, and that, that happened in an area. I don't want to say where it happened, no, but no, that's okay. um, yeah, long that's ways good. away from Port Lock. And so that, of course, <laughs> that was shortly after I got back too. So, um, I was like, <laughs> well, you got somebody's, a, somebody's attention for yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> 
Wow. But it just it just led me to to look into things a lot more, and I've I've had a lot of people reach out, and actually knowing that I that I'm involved in the kind of business that I'm in, I've had a lot of people ask me like, "Hey, would you consider doing like a a trip, like an expedition that we could go out and maybe relive some of these different experiences and do this you know type of expedition?" And and um, it's it's in the works. So oh, yay. Congratulations. Well, you, have an, you have an open door policy here on the outer realm. So if you find yourself on an expedition and um, you're having some experiences, we'd love to have you on. Come back. Tell us all about it. Or, you know, give us some if we can plan it right. Maybe we could do like catch you on on site somewhere. Um, yeah. Do, or do you like guys a live show. service, though. Oh, yeah, that would no, be, would be no, it wouldn't work. There's no cell service. Mm. You could try to call in on like a sat phone, but you never know how long a sat phone call is going to last. But that would be one possibility. Yes. Um, yeah. Or yeah. you just, or you guys just go yourselves. <laughs> sure. We'll yeah, hire okay. you to we'll, take us. <laughs> we'll, we'll switch out. We'll come to Alaska. We'll do the whole, I'll even suck it up, do the whole <laughs> camping <you> thing. <laughs> but, never imagine we will well i i love the mountains and the forest i love all of it i just i wouldn't even know where to start to camp that's the only thing but um we'll do that and then we'll <laughs> have to take you to a haunted location oh shit I don't and know about that. <laughs> <laughs> see it's uh, just different isn't it it's just different a double-edged it's, sword there i don't know <laughs> yeah that's i mean I, I would totally do that, but that's like, I mean, that stuff, that stuff's crazy. Um, that's crazy. Me in a tent is insane. So if <laughs> I can swallow that, you can walk into a haunted house and we'll film uh, that. I think it would be hilarious. It would be awesome. Okay. As long as, long as there's there. hopefully no long-term inflicted damage afterwards. We'll make sure you're protected. It can't be worse okay. than having big stones the size of your head being yeah. thrown at you guys. You're, you're, the, you're the guard in the forest. We're the guard on the, the realm. So okay, we'll make then, sure you're protected. And, and that way then, okay, totally, deal. I'll, I'll <laughs> <Okay. start. laughs> bravo, bravo. I had a feeling I could do that. Well, <laughs> honestly, I can't even believe it's been like, two hours we're at yeah. the top of the hour already that's crazy i know <laughs> tell me but thank you for coming on it was really nice yeah. to to hear you know your side of of all of these experiences it, it is it does i can imagine be very difficult when you're with a group of people and everybody's trying to share their stories during an interview so i'm really glad that we were able to do a one-on-one -on -one and you you know just giving us how it was for you what it was like yeah. for you thank you for that yeah yeah thank thank you guys it's been great i mean it's it's been a it's been a great um great discussion and i'm I'm glad i was able to share some of the things i could share and uh yeah you, you know there's a lot so many things that happened out there it's 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 hard to even recount it all um so it's nice to to get back into a sort of a, a round table like this where we can talk about it and yeah. bring some of these things out to the light and you know and there's a lot of other things like i said that happened that didn't get put in the show and and mm. who knows if those will ever really make it out into the world and people will know about it's it it's sad that it doesn't because it's usually some of the best stuff yeah. that sits on the I, cutting room floor that i think that's producers see. feeling things out the first season and then you never know it might show up in season two they might look back and use that as a concept to move forward well, one yeah, thing that it, producers yeah. like to do are shows that are just um, extra reels with extra bonus pieces yeah, in them, and we, they replay them. That's what we talked about. We need to have just like a like a show sometime that just is just all about the crazy stuff. Like oh, like a blooper reel, but like, <laughs> you know, like where you guys are just all talking and it's just playing in the background. That's yeah, a great idea. There we go. Yeah, maybe it would, it's a it would, sometimes it i have them you know sometimes they it's come a future <laughs> show we have millions of people listen yeah well there's there's definitely a lot um i mean like i said there's so many things um you, some of it un, unfortunately some of it wasn't caught on film and it's only our personal stories that we have but mm -hmm. luckily there's a lot of stuff that did happen um that was caught on film and Hopefully we can show it like just that, that tent thing I told you about, or that thing. <laughs> I'd up love to see that. Um, yes. That as far as I know, that was captured. Um, That's pretty cool. 
Yeah. It was actually captured from a, I think at the time there was actually a drone flying too. And wow. the drone may have caught the footage. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe you just drones. ask for some of, like, little little clips yeah. of some of this stuff that you guys could. I'll tell you something. If they allowed you to use it to do interviews like this, you may just get your season two. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, now that, that my summer season of my my day job, if you will, is, right. uh, is starting to wind down, um, you know, that's something I definitely want to um, – get more active and involved in. Um, I know mm -hmm. the guys have been working really, really hard, <clears throat> kind of keeping the momentum and the energy levels up and, um, you know, trying to keep people interested and engaged in the show really well. And, and they've been doing a great job with it. <clears throat> and so I just, hopefully I can get, get more involved with that because it's, you know, it, it's not, it's to us, it's not so much about the TV show aspect. Um, yeah, it's kind of cool in a way, <clears throat> having been on a TV show and, and seeing these experiences played out. But it opens doors, if anything. We're, yeah, we're not. It's not like <clears throat> we're not fame junkies. You know, we're not trying to go out and be famous. It's we we want to mm -hmm. be able to share these stories with the world and get these people to see it. And mm -hmm. quite frankly, I think I think we discovered some things that could potentially rewrite some history books. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. Part. And yeah. yeah. And the only way we can, we can really get this stuff out is to put it in this kind of forum where we're able to show people on a wide scale mass audience mm -hmm. where we can, we can do interviews and talk about some stuff. But I, I really think from a professional production level of being able to, you know, get the, <clears throat> the right equipment out there to be able to document this stuff and see it, um, and, and stuff is just, it's really the way to go. <clears throat> so unlike, I think, you know, there, there's definitely some, some shows and there's, there's some projects that, you know, my own opinion is they're only be done. They're, they're only being done sort of out of pure sort of fame and stardom. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that in the field. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but the integrity amongst you and the credibility and the the knowledge and the experience, it's a well-built team and it's a phenomenal show. Creating awareness is the best way to go. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, yeah. If, if you don't get it. your season two, you should really consider a documentary that, that you guys can have done. And um, that way you could take it to places like all, all these big, I don't want, I, mean, I want to just blurt out the names, but all these big streaming platforms that are out there and they are always, always looking for content. It's good to know. Yeah. That's, oh, yeah. So far yeah. Off. That stuff is so far off my radar. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. My, my, my only, you know, work prior to something like this was just like doing bear guard work with like random mm -hmm. filters or whatever. Right. Yeah. Right. But um, yeah, it's an interesting experience how that whole, how the process works and everything goes mm -hmm. down. Um, but it's, uh, you know, First and foremost, it's important to the people of Nan Wallach um, that they get some answers, not only about a potential town site, but also maybe what it is that's out there. And is it harmful? Because there's there are some folks that have had experiences or they know people have had experiences and they're deathly afraid um, to go yeah. out there. They're deathly afraid of whatever it is, the entity, Nantinuk, um, whatever it might be. Um, so we hope to get some answers and shed some light on that and maybe, maybe show that maybe it's not maybe, or maybe it is, we don't, we don't know. Yeah. Um, we feel that a lot of us have the, the opinion, um, that after being out there that at least for us, it didn't mean any harm. Right. Um, I think if it, if it wanted to harm us it easily it, it could have very oh easily. absolutely and, and you wouldn't have seen fun. it coming <laughs> either yeah. you wouldn't have seen it coming hence the rock yeah. walking through yeah. down a path boom down yeah some of the size of the rocks that got thrown <laughs> yeah. out there they they could easily you know take out yeah. a grown grown person um, oh easily easily well i am i'm just thrilled that you came on the show to um share your experiences with us and i thank you so much for doing that. I now have to wind down this show and log us all off. Yeah, we're, we're over time. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> well, I, I really I appreciate you having me on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for yes. sharing all of that. It was good yes. to see you. 
Yeah, yes. good seeing you. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll be in touch. Okay. <laughs> right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Right, <laughs> well, that was amazing. Wow, wow, wow is all I've got to say on that. So huge thank you to Kyle McDowell um, from the Alaskan Killer Bigfoot TV show. It was just, you. it's so interesting to catch things behind the scenes as well and to get, you know, the right from the horse's mouth, so to speak. If you guys haven't seen the show, please Google it, seek it out, see if you guys um, have it on any of your local stations. It is just really worth the watch. So big thank you. Um, and again, you guys want to contact us, the Outer Realm Contact at gmail.com, the Outer Realm Contact at gmail.com. Big thank you to our sponsors, Folgers Coffee, and to Dr. Snick, a.k.a. the Sonic Surgeon, Justin Snicker. Thank you, thank you. Uh, still going to be a harpy about the Folgers commercials, people. Want to be promoted? Great way to do it. You just have to do it with Folgers. That's all I'm going to say. So next week, we have two returning guests. Wednesday welcomes back Constance Victoria Briggs. She will be discussing extraterrestrials, the moon. Oh, what you think? Mm, anyway. The dark side. Yeah, so much more. So if you missed her the first time, definitely this is your opportunity to catch her again. And Thursday night is probably one of the Outer Realm fan favorites. <laughs> People love Peter Pentagore. And he's going to be talking about UFOs and such. And uh, he's done a lot of talking about his near-death experiences. Just total wealth of information. Um, like I said, you guys love him. So we love him. It all works <laughs> out, right? There we go. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow night, catch the Church of Mabus from 8 until 10 p.m. Eastern. And no, yes, it is 8 until 10 p.m. Eastern. And the Centralist from 10, I'm pretty sure it's 10 to 12. So I should know this because I'm thinking in central time. So I'm a bit messed up, but they are back to back. So do check them out. And remember any platform that you guys happen to be on, <clears throat> subscribe, like, join, show us your support. We love you. We appreciate you. We try to bring you the absolute best content that we can. We all have a good time. So give us some love. Come on. <laughs> anyway, until then, everybody have a great weekend and we'll see you next week. Thank you.